Good Lord, ride all the way. A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello and welcome to SLU's celebration of the September equinox. My name is Paul Cox and I'm your host today and we've teamed up with our, our friends at the Old Farmers Almanac to welcome in this changing of the season. So right now it's a beautiful summer's day here at SLU HQ in Connecticut this morning uh, but in 20 minutes time it's going to be a beautiful autumn or fall day. And that switch between summer and autumn occurs at the very moment of equinox, and that's at 21 minutes past the hour. But what is equinox? Uh, do we really experience an equal amount of day and night? Uh, how did ancient cultures mark the movement of the sun and moon in the skies? And probably the most important question of all, can you really stand an egg? on its end, on the day of equinox. Uh, now then, uh, to help us answer these and any questions you want answered today via Twitter using at SLU, we have three very special guests lined up for you. Uh, first of all, we've got Janice Stillman. Uh, Janice is the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Then we're gonna be speaking to SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Uh, and then we're really excited to welcome Dr. Gail Higginbog Higginbottom, uh, Gail is a visiting research fellow at the University of Adelaide in Australia, and she's going to be telling us about her research uh, into ancient stone circles and how they've been used for millennia to uh, measure the position of the sun and moon. Now then, this is SLU, so we've lined up some terrific live views for you today. Uh, these are anchored, of course, by SLU's special solar telescope at our flagship observatory, you were just seeing that that's at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. Uh, the combination of this incredibly complex instrument uh, based at a world-class observatory site at 8,000 feet altitude gives us these breathtaking views of the sun and various solar features. In fact, if uh, the studio can take off my picture, you'll see that there's something hovering above the sun just at the moment. And SLU members get to see uh, this live feed every day. And uh, yeah, you can just sit off to the right. Uh, anyway, they get to uh, see this uh, live view every day and snap their own images using the Starshare camera at slu.com. Now then, a little later, uh, we're expecting a second live solar feed coming from SLU partner, Matt Francis. He's the director of the Prescott Observatory in Arizona. He's actually in California this morning uh, where the sun hasn't actually risen yet. Uh, so that'll be pretty cool to see a close up view of the sun as it rises above the California horizon. Uh, let's check in uh, at the SLU Canary Islands Observatory to see what conditions look like just 20 minutes away from the moment of equinox. Well, we've got sunny skies here. Uh, this is our dome cam. Uh, that shows the three domes housing the telescope. SLU members control every night uh, from this amazing sight image. Galaxies, nebulae, comets, planets, and just about any other object in the night sky they want to share with the rest of the community. Now we can pull back a little bit further to take a look at our live observatory panorama. This view, it kind of shows some of the other observatories located at this site. Uh, this is a great view at night as well to check the sky conditions. And we can even step back a few miles from the observatory to check conditions on the volcano this morning. This live camera is uh, located on the huge volcanic cone of Pico del Tedi and looks down on the observatory site. You can just about make out uh, the white domes and solar telescope towers on the ridge near the center of the image. And I think it's easy to see why the Canary Islands are home to the largest uh, optical telescope in the world, and SLU's telescope. Uh, I think I've got the best office in the world, haven't I? Uh, but uh, the equinox isn't just a local event at our observatory site, it's happening around the globe. And we're tapping into uh, live cameras all over the world uh, to watch the sun shine down on Earth from locations across the continents, thanks to uh, the EarthCam network. Now, let's take a quick look at this. Uh, we've got uh, Budapest in Hungary. Now, this view uh, overlooks the famous Danube River, river the, uh, the second longest river in Europe. It's used, uh, used to be the foothold, I believe, of the Roman Empire. 
among other things. It's also a venue for the Red Bull Air Race, which I'm pretty keen on. Uh, now, further to the east, we have a live view from uh, Doha in Qatar. This tiny, tiny country in the Middle East. It's actually near sunset there, as you can see. The buildings are being lit up, you know, from the side. Uh, so we might be able to watch the sun as it slips below the horizon uh, throughout the course of the show. And then, of course, we've got a couple of cameras in the USA, in uh, New York City, uh, taking a look at Lower Manhattan. And uh, here's a fun fact for you, actually. Uh, Manhattan, it shares some of the geometry to sites like Stonehenge, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later on. And on days close to the solstices, not the equinox, um, the sun actually shines directly down some of the streets and avenues between the skyscrapers. And uh, the phenomenon's been uh, referred to now as Manhattan Henge, which is quite good. I didn't think I was going to be able to say that. Manhattan Henge, good word. Uh, now then, a little later on in the show, uh, we will take a look at the live views of sunrise over Seattle, Washington. Uh, that should be pretty spectacular too. Now, don't go anywhere because we are going to be right back with Janice Stillman of the Old Farmers Almanac after this short commercial break. And welcome back to the show. Today we're celebrating the changing of the seasons as we count down the minutes to the moment of the September equinox. And what better way to do that uh, than with our friends at the Old Farmers Almanac. We team up with them regularly uh, for full moon shows every month. Uh, my next guest also joined us last week for our Harvest Moon Lunar Eclipse broadcast, uh, which was great fun. Now, if you miss that, don't forget SLU members can watch any of our previous shows on demand over at slew.com, so uh, enjoy those. Now, uh, the moment of the sun across the sky has been used to mark and measure the flow and ebb of time for millennia. Uh, the solstices and the equinoxes have been sort of uh, the goalposts in that marking. Uh, the major markers of these celestial times throughout the year. Uh, we'll be speaking to Dr. Hale Gail Higginbottoms, I'm sorry, Gail, I'll get that right later on. Uh, Gail Higginbottom, uh, a little later in the show about the ways ancient cultures have actually measured that movement using stone circles. But our next guest is uh, joining us to talk about some of the customs associated with the equinox. So I'm delighted to welcome Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmers Almanac. Welcome to the show, Janice. Good morning. Good morning, Paul. Goodbye, Summer. It is, it is, isn't it? Now, the Old Farmer's Almanac has this wonderful record of the traditional celebrations marked by different cultures, uh, and, and the equinox is celebrated in a number of ways. I, and I know you've been digging into the Almanac archives, and you found a few of these celebrations, and you mentioned one before the show uh, from my home country, uh, England, uh, that was a feast of some kind, is that right? I think you're referring to Harvest Hall. Yep. That's the traditional event that in Europe and Britain marked the end of season because it was also the end of harvest. And it was a festival of fun and feasting and thanksgiving and also called, you know, just not just harvesting, but in gathering or inning. It was a time to hold elections because, of course, everybody's been busy for months now and now they had a bit of rest. It was a time to pay workers because, of course, the, the produce was sold at market and there was money in pockets. And it was also a time, as a result, to collect rents, to take that money out of pockets again. Uh -huh. Bonfires actually were held to celebrate the fruitfulness of the field. Now, wasn't there um, something about St. Michaelmas? Am I saying that correctly? Yes. That's a fun little item. Now, we have Harvest Home, and we mark that in the Old Farmer's Almanac. Can you, I don't know if you can hear that, but that's the fire alarm here in town in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it will only be one ring. Just to show we're live. In, Scotland, in the Orkney Islands off Scotland, the celebration at the end of harvest was called Muckle Supper. Muckle Supper. 
And for years, the origin of that was believed by many folks to mean simply a large event, because of course, that's what these celebrations were. But then a bit of anthropology and perhaps sociology and just clarification it was determined that muckle was a corruption of mickle, that uh -huh. being the Norse term for Michael and a reference to a feast in the Christian calendar in the Celtic environment to St. Michaelmas, also at this time of year, and specifically now on September 29. That celebrates the archangel Michael, the highest angel who battled the devil and is now considered the patron of police and soldiers and different, you know, defenders, if you will. St. Saint, Saint Michaelmas marks the end of season on our calendar or the end of a quarter of the year, and thus was called a quarter day. Other quarter days in the traditional calendar include March, which is the vernal equinox, of course, and then in June and December on the solstices. Now, I, I've, I've got a note here that we've got um, something about a breastbone having a very specific use in some of these celebrations. Yes, often on St. Michaelmas Day, again, September 29, Folks would eat goose. They would roast a goose and have that for dinner. It was typically an indication or a wish for prosperity for the forthcoming year. Farmers also included a goose often with their rent payments to their landlords as a, as a friendly gift. So folks would roast the goose and then carve it, careful not to cut, cut the breastbone, not to destroy it. The breastbone was removed and cleaned and set on a shelf to dry. And a reading of the dried goose's breastbone could indicate the weather for the forthcoming winter, for example. And we people still do this today. So in Thanksgiving mm. or some other wonderful event, it doesn't have to be a holiday, you might want to try this. If your breastbone, goose breastbone, is white, that indicates a mild winter. Okay. If you notice on it purple tips, that indicates a cold spring. If the breastbone has splays of blue, that is just dashes of blue throughout it, expect a fine weather, a fine winter, no bad weather until New Year's Day. But here's the other side of it. If the breastbone is all dark blue and the darker it is, the worse the winter is likely to be. So a dark breastbone typically meant the goose had absorbed a lot of oil. It's natural protection against oh, okay. the cold and thus the translation, if you will, ah, that a dark breastbone indicated a cold, wet, cold winter was coming. Right. So there's kind of uh, there's kind of some uh, some rationale behind that. Now, Janice, uh, we're going to take a short commercial break now. But when we come back, you and I are going to have a little bit of fun with some eggs. And if our audience uh, wants to uh, join in, go get an egg from your fridge. Uh, and uh, other than that, don't go anywhere. And don't forget, I'll be talking to Bob Berman about uh, why the equinox is isn't actually a day of equal uh, day of and night. Uh, we'll be right back with our eggs shortly. And uh, welcome back to the show as we celebrate the uh, September equinox here at SLU. I'm here with Janice Stillman, uh, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Uh, Janice, before uh, the break, we teased a bit. Um, uh, not an urban legend, but certainly a widely held belief that you can balance an egg on its end during the equinox. Now, this is it came from vernal equinox, which is in March. Now, you and I are going to take... Uh, uh, I'm going to park some rationality for the moment, and um, a very nice poncho, by the way. Um, can you help me understand, uh, where did this belief uh, start from, do you think? Well, I've got the poncho on in case my egg breaks, by the way. <laughs> According to folklore, a raw, a raw egg can be stood on its fat end only twice a year on the spring equinox and on the autumn equinox. And I'm trying this on some back issues of the Old Farmer's Almanac, this being our <laughs> 225th year, I thought it might bring me better luck. 
<laughs> the egg balance belief is ancient and the specific logic behind it is unknown. Some people thought that special gravitational balance existed only on these two days of the year. Some people thought it had to do with the length of day and night being approximately the same everywhere. I don't know if I dare let go of this egg, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so try it. And Have if you, you feel particularly clever or skilled... Have you ever seen this work, Janice? Try the pointed end, which is, of course, the more challenging end. But even if you do not succeed in Yay, cracking look at that. code... Now, I'm just going to ah. move my webcam to show that there are no tricks involved. Uh, here is my egg. This is actually not the first time we've done it today. Um, we, uh, we did have a photograph of me earlier. Uh, doing it, and uh, if we can just see, there's absolutely uh, nothing on the bottom of this egg. We're not uh, we're not pulling a fast one here. So, uh, by the way, if if you can't do it with an egg at home, uh, I do understand that it's a lot lot easier with uh, an apple. So you can try that. So, uh, Janice, have you have you had any luck there? No, I haven't. But if folks outside have any do not succeed in cracking the code, remember this is no yolk. The equinox wah, wah, is about wah. balanced light, not balanced eggs or special gravity. Now then, uh, as I say, that, that uh, it, it has been associated with uh, the vernal equinox in March. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll talk to Bob Berman to see if exactly what is causing this. I can actually tell you that as well because we did some experimentation here. But uh, Janice, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. It's always a great pleasure to uh, see you here with your wonderful knowledge from the Old Farmer's Almanac. I, I'm glad you didn't have to use the uh, poncho in the end. I congratulate you with your egg trick. That's very good. Thank you very much. And there was no tricky, trickery involved there at all. So bye-bye, Janice. Take uh, That was Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now we are looking here, this fabulous, uh, panoramic view of uh, the Canary Islands Observatory. This is uh, our flagship observatory where the telescopes are that SLU members use every night. Now, next, I'm going to be joined by SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Uh, it's one in the same, actually. It's Bob Berman. And Bob's going to help us understand the actual mechanics of the equinox and explain uh, why you won't actually get exactly equal uh, hours of day and night today, despite its name. And a little bit later, we'll be welcoming uh, Dr. Gail Higginbottom, uh, a research fellow at the University of Adelaide in Australia. Now, she's recently published research about the great stone circles around the world, like Stonehenge. Uh, we'll be talking to her about how these ancient cultures use them to measure the ebb and flow um, and to mark the, uh, the seasons and map the movement of the sun. But before that, uh, we've got uh, hundreds of thousands of people, I'm being told, watching Equinox Live with SLU today. Now, all of you out there, young and young at heart, uh, tuning into the show, uh, I really want to encourage uh, you to become uh, a member of the SLU community, to join our expedition. Our members aren't passengers on this expedition, but rather signed on as working crew to take control of these robotic telescopes we've been showing you in the Canary Islands and in Chile. And uh, to, that they use them to share the most interesting places in space with everyone else in the community. And so far, SLU's social exploration. Uh, together, we've visited over 50,000 different places in the sky and captured well over 5 million photos. Uh, and working as a team makes it easy to learn from each other as well and share our diverse perspectives and that's fueled in equal part by science and imagination and that human spirit to uh, search and wonder. Now, who knows, we may be alone in the universe and uh, having a look at that little object that was floating off the sun earlier, I'm not sure if we are, but you will never be alone uh, at SLU. And uh, the secret is out now, a year in the making, there's a new SLU coming. That's right, smarter and more powerful than ever. We're so excited to show you that when that's ready. So you really are welcome aboard Stu's expedition into outer space, which is free to try. So uh, do join our adventure into the great unknown. Now, we are going to be right back with Bob Berman after this short commercial break.
Welcome back to SLU and our celebration of the equinox. Uh, now we are fast approaching the actual moment of the equinox, which occurs at 21 minutes past the hour. Now I would like to just say a quick hello to uh, Kate uh, Colello's uh, class in Spring Hill, Florida, who are watching us. So uh, hi everyone down there. Hey, I can see you. Hey, I can see you watching me, watching you now. So anyway, welcome to the show. Um, uh, that's uh, Miss Colello's class in Spring Hill, Florida. I hope the sun's shining down there. Now, in a moment, I'll be joined by slew astronomer Bob Berman. But before I welcome him to the show, let's take another quick look at our feeds. Um, now then, ooh, we are very, very close now to the equinox. So while we look at this live image of our sun, uh, our star, it's the moment of equinox. Happy equinox, everybody. There you go. There's the countdown. This is a live view. You are watching a live view of the sun through SLU's special solar telescope, which SLU members get to watch every single day. And we've got some absolutely cracking features there. We've got some prominences and filaments and all sorts of things. And that is that incredibly complex piece of equipment that I put together earlier on in the year. Uh, SLU members, I've given an explanation to them about just how... Uh, complex this is to do remotely. There's nobody there at the observatory while this is operating. Uh, now then, uh, that was, uh, we've seen the uh, equinox pass, but we haven't really spoken about what the equinox is. And there's one person that can help us out of anyone else in the world, and that's SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. That's Bob Berman. Bob, welcome to our global celebration of uh, September equinox. Oh, thank you, Paul. Great, great to be here. <laughs> now, I'm sorry you missed the uh, magic moment. Are you feeling any different, Bob? No, no, no. I, I've been watching this, and uh, am I? Yes, it's everything's changed. Boom! Everything. It's a it's a change. <laughs> One thing I have noticed, though, is that Janice kept saying um, equinox, and you've kept saying equinox. So I'm sure That's people right. are wondering which is correct. The correct is. Equinox. Uh, however, you're British, and in Britain, I, British. I, I think you, you say equinox. And I've checked it in several dictionaries now. And although some say you can only say equinox, there's at least one that says you can say either. So nobody's wrong. Just to I've let you know, just ever, in case people I've, were wondering. Yeah, I've only ever heard it in the UK um, in any number of shows as equinox. In fact, there are even shows called equinox. So. Uh, uh, I'm going to take the high ground on that one, Bob, because I'm English <laughs> and we invented the language. <laughs> now, Bob, we haven't talked about the very basics. This is an equinox today. The actual moment of equinox has just passed. And the day means equal night. But that's not really true, is it? Day and night aren't actually equal today. So why is that? Well, because of our atmosphere, really, that bends the sun's image upward. If we had no air, then yes, every place on Earth would see exactly the same amount of night and day today. But because of the air bending the sun's image up by its own diameter, half a degree, when it's on the horizon, when it sits on the horizon, it's not really there. We're seeing a ghost, a phantom, an illusion. The real sun has already set and the setting sun still sits on the horizon. This gives us a few extra minutes of sunshine in the evening and a few extra minutes also at dawn. So it pushes the real time of uh, the equinox to uh, uh, half a week later, sometimes as much as a week, depending upon your latitude. Yeah, I think at the moment, uh, mid, mid northern latitudes where we are here in Connecticut, uh, I think uh, that equal day and night actually occurs on the 24th and 25th, I think, this year. But, but Bob, we see this effect actually quite a lot at the Canary Islands Observatory. If we can flick back to the lovely panoramic views there, because we actually see we're so high up here that we see beyond zero altitude. But there's another factor. It's not just the refraction of the light. It has to do with the actual angular size of the sun as well, doesn't it? Because is, is sunset actually marked by when the center of the sun goes below the horizon, but we're still kind of seeing the top of the sun, aren't we? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you take the, the center of the sun, uh, that's about one and a half minutes different in most places 
from um, when the sun completely disappears. It actually depends on your latitude also. At the equator, it takes two minutes for the sun to transit its own width through the horizon line. But in places in mid-northern latitudes, all of the United States, Europe, etc., it's going to take uh, three minutes because the sun is going down at an angle, at a slant, yep. and so it doesn't drop down like a lead ball. It slides in at an angle, slides down and to the right. Now, how about the date of this particular equinox, Bob? Is, is there any relevance in that? Is, isn't it a little later than normal? <laughs> yes, oh, look yes. At this. It's very look interesting, this that the, and people don't notice this, that the March equinox, the start of spring, is on the 20th of March, but the uh, September equinox is always on the 23rd or the 22nd, a little earlier this year being on the 22nd. Uh, so why do you get that uh, two or three day uh, difference? And that's sort of to disguise something that very few people realize, which is that the year is not made of equal halves. Rather, because Earth travels so quickly in its orbit when it's whipped around the sun when we're closest to the sun, which is the first week of January, that during that cold half of the year, we move through that faster. There's not enough time for the same number of days, rotations of Earth. And so you get more rotations of Earth during the other half, quote unquote, between the autumn equinox going to the spring, the cold half of the year for those in the northern hemisphere, than you do in the warm half. So two things hide that fact, because very few, if you ask most people, they say, no, the year is in two unequal halves. We have one week extra sunlight brightness than we do non-brightness. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's due to that. The changing equinoxes, uh, that, that accounts for part of it, and the short February month, coupled with the two long summer months, July and August, thanks to Julius and Augustus, both really insisting on long months each for themselves. Between the two of them, that does the job, that finishes the job of hiding the fact that we have unequal halves to the year. What do you think of this wonderful uh, live view of uh, sunrise in Seattle, Bob? Isn't that gorgeous? It's gorgeous, yes. That's great. great. And it's a special day. You know, the equinox feels special. It's a time when we're all sharing something. The Earth is almost poised, balanced and motionless before we rush headlong into the northern winter. Absolutely. And we started the show in summer, but uh, it's now autumn or fall. Now, Bob, uh, we're going to take a short commercial break now. But when we come back, you're going to tell us about uh, the odd movement of the sun around the period of equinox and uh, actually talking of uh, speaking of the movement of the sun a little later on this show i'll be joined by dr gail higginbottom uh, to discuss the way ancient cultures used uh, the great stone circles like the ones at stonehenge uh, to trace the movement across the sun uh, to, to track the movement of the sun and moon and to mark the ebb and flow of time and the passing of the season so we'll be right back with bob berman right after this short commercial break And welcome back to the show. We're celebrating the uh, September equinox around the world here at Sue. Now, if you're watching, uh, like some of the classes, uh, do uh, tweet to at SLU. Or if you've got any uh, questions to Bob, but send us some photos of you watching live equinox. Uh, now, the moment of uh, equinox has passed, uh, but the day of equinox continues. I'm joined once again by uh, SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Hi, Bob. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Paul. Now, before we took our commercial break, uh, I said we'd talk about the movement of the sun around the period of equinox. The, the geometry of Earth and the sun at equinox affects uh, the, the way the terminator, that region separating day and night, moves across the Earth, doesn't it? It really does. Most people, I think, know that this is the one day of the year, along with the spring equinox, that the sun rises due east, cardinal east, and sets cardinal west. But why? And the answer is 
as you say, it's that the day-night line, the Terminator, sounds like the movie, that separates day from night. Right now, it's running straight down from the North Pole to the South Pole. It's the only time that it's not going at some sort of slant. And therefore, as Earth is rotating, no matter where you are, your location is going to slam into that Terminator at the sunset moment perpendicularly at a 90-degree angle. We all meet it at that angle today, and that, that's producing that consequence and some others, too. So the sun is moving in a very specific way, isn't it? It is. Uh, this is the only day of the year, along with the spring equinox, that uh, it goes in a straight line across the sky. So if you took a time-lapse picture, which you're so good at doing um, in so many ways here at SLU, if you took a picture of the sun every five or ten minutes, uh, with a proper filter, of course, and then showed the sun's path across the sky, this is the only time that it's a laser straight line. If you live in the northern hemisphere for the rest of the year, the sun has a curve that is concave toward the north, concave upward, like a smile. During the cold half of the year, the sun's path during the day is like a rainbow, like a frown. It moves this way. Uh, any time exposure photograph will show you that movement. Not today. Today it's absolutely laser straight, east to west, straight line across the sky. And we can see here this live view from uh, Budapest in Hungary. And we can see the shadows starting to draw longer there as they go into that late afternoon. Now, uh, Bob, we've got a question from Dave on Twitter. And Dave is asking, does the equinox always occur at the same time? Uh, we said today very specifically it was 10.21 uh, a.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, 14.21 UTC. So next year, is it going to be happening at exactly the same time? No, and that's because of the way our calendar works. On the short term, depending upon whether your year uh, has a leap year, is a leap year or not, or the years in between, we meet, it's always going to be defined as the time when Earth is straight up and down to the sun, when the sun is right over Earth's equator, when that terminator runs from the North Pole to the South Pole. But how that matches up with our clocks and calendars, that's what varies, because we have this slightly different playing catch-up cycle. And then on top of that, it's really a 400-year calendar, as you know. And this past year 2000, we did a really weird twerk to it, and that's making the equinox uh, go earlier and earlier than they have been in four centuries. Many of us grew up thinking of the March equinox, for example, as March 21st. Mm. Uh, now it's always the 20th. It's never the 21st anymore, and it's going to be the 19th later on in the century. This one, the September equinox, a little bit odder. It's still usually the 23rd, but sometimes now it's starting to be the 22nd, like today. Now, now, equinox is also the moment when here in the northern hemisphere, we, we start to notice the days getting shorter, but the days have actually been getting shorter for a while. So why do we associate the equinox with that change, Bob? Because it's the maximum part of the change. When we right. started getting shorter, that is on the solstice, if you could really accurately see the diminishing of sunlight one or two days later, it was a matter of seconds. By the time we, you had gotten to several weeks after the June solstice, now it was perhaps a minute a day. And then it, it speeds up. It's like a sine wave pattern, and we're at the steepest part of that. The uh, fall equinox represents the very fastest loss of daylight per day, which can be as little as nothing if you lived at the equator, or it can be as long as seven minutes a day if you lived in Fairbanks, Alaska. For, for most of uh, Americans, it's about three minutes a day. I think for you in uh, Britain, it's closer to four, isn't it? A four and a half, something like that. Uh, Bob, uh, what can I say? Thank you so much for joining us today to help us celebrate uh, September equinox. Uh, we will see you back on another SLU show uh, very soon, I hope. Thank you, Paul. I like how you say it better, by the way. It sounds more like equanimitous. I, I, I like that better. I'm going to try to, to say it that way. Adopt Thank that you. one. It's stand out a bit in the crowd. So thanks, Bob. <laughs> uh, a quick uh, hello, by the way, to uh, Kristen Rolden at Booker T. Washington Senior High School. Hi, everyone there. We are looking at this fabulous, fabulous live view of our sun from the SLU Solar Telescope. Very special 
uh, telescope. Um, and we can just see a filament there on the right hand side, that kind of snaking S shape. And that, as the sun rotates and the Earth goes around it, we start to see a prominence coming out of the other side. We saw this little object floating off the surface a little bit earlier. We're going to take a close look at that. Anyway, uh, that was Bob Berman, sleep astronomer and longtime astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now, we are going to take a very quick commercial break, but do not go anywhere. Uh, because we are going to be joined by our very special guest, Dr. Gail Higginbottom of the University of Adelaide in Australia, who has stayed up late uh, tonight uh, to tell us about her new research into the Great Stone Circles and their importance uh, to ancient cultures around the world. So we'll be right back after this short commercial break. And welcome back to SLU. We've been celebrating the equinox this morning with our live views of the sun from around the world. Now, in a few moments, we'll be joined by a very special guest, a hemisphere away uh, from SLU HQ here in Connecticut. Uh, but before we do that, I want to take a moment to take a quick look at our feeds. Now, this one is the SLU Solar Telescope, and members get to see this every day. And don't forget, SLU members, if you're watching the show, on the slew.com live channel. You'll be able to uh, press the button and snap your own images. Um, and we're also waiting actually for our feed from Matt Francis, uh, which is about to come online as well. But look at this, this is sunrise in Seattle. How cool is that? Yeah, it's just marking the ebb and flow of time around the world. Uh, now, uh, without further ado, uh, We've already, actually, we've, that's a bit of a spoiler there, wasn't it, really? Uh, we've all heard of the great stone circles around the world. They pop up in places from New Hampshire to Scotland to my local stone circle, the uh, famous Stonehenge in the southwest of England. Now, our next guest uh, recently published a paper featuring new evidence that proves ancient cultures used these stones to measure the movement of the sun and moon. Dr. Gail Higginbottom is a research fellow at the University of Adelaide in Australia and has kindly decided to stay up late tonight uh, to join us on our live broadcast. Dr. Higginbottom, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Ah, good evening from Adelaide. Uh, uh, my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Now, what time is it there, Gail? I think it's about quarter past uh, 12 in the morning. Oh, thank you so much Not for doing bad. this for us. You know, we're, we're just at uh, mid-morning here in Connecticut. Now, let's start at the very beginning. What sets you on your path to research the use of these stone circles, which to me are, are just such fascinating and intriguing uh, objects? Uh, I've always had a fascination uh, with the uh, history of uh, humanity and their interest in the sky um, and in history in general. But one day a friend and I were looking at an American, uh, Scientific American uh, magazine, actually. It was a very small article on that about the mysteries of standing stones in the British Isles. And my friend just turned to me and said, well, why don't you um, do that for your master's thesis? And I went, Okay, I can I can solve this problem. <laughs> it began like now, that. <laughs> now, now you're an archaeologist, as as your you know, your, your title shows there. Um, but do you need a little bit of astronomical knowledge here as well to to help dig into this whole subject? Uh, um, um, absolutely, mainly um, observational astronomy, so naked eye astronomy, and I um, mostly. Uh, for, at least in the British Isles, I mostly focus on the moon and the sun. But uh, as a PhD student, um, I had a supervisor who was an astronomer and astrophysicist by the name of Roger Clay. And I am with him again now at the University of Adelaide uh, doing more new research. Now, we've long suspected, haven't we, that, you know, these stone circles were used to measure uh, the movement of the sun and the moon. Why did you decide to go about proving this mathematically? 
Um, basically, there are a couple of people who had done quite a bit of, uh, well, a lot of field work in Scotland yeah. and across the British Isles. Uh, called um, uh, one was Clive Ruggles, um, Professor Ruggles, and the other was Alexander Tom. But it seemed to me that uh, whilst they had managed to do, of course, some statistical tests, we were at an advantage now because we had. Uh, geographical information system data, like lots of data about the topography surrounding the sites and a lot of computing power. And I thought we can do more sophisticated mathematical slash statistical tests now. We have the opportunity to be able to test things in a more um, sound fashion than perhaps people were able to in the past. They did yes. an excellent job for what they could do with, with uh, the tools they had at the time, but there really wasn't as much support as there could have been, I thought. So I wanted to test it. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to take a really quick break now, but when we come back, I'd like sure. to talk a, a little bit more about the locations of these circles and how that influenced the way that they were used by the builders. So uh, I look forward to hearing all about that. We'll be uh, right back after this commercial break. And welcome back. We've been uh, spending the last three quarters of an hour, 40 minutes, uh, spending the day celebrating the equinox, looking at the sun from around the world and talking about the many ways humans have looked at the, the same sun and understood it over millennia. Now, delighted to welcome back our special guest, Dr. Gail Higginbottom uh, from the University of Adelaide in Australia, where the sun is not shining right now because it's the dead of night. So, Gail, welcome back. So, uh, Thank now, you. Now, these stone circles, they they had to be built with a great deal of accuracy in order to measure this movement of the sun and moon. But your paper actually links them to more than just their placement relative to the sun. It also has uh, something to do with what's around them on Earth as well, doesn't it? Wow, look at this lovely, oh. lovely image of Stonehenge. It's a beautiful Isn't picture. That, doesn't that <laughs> sum it up? I mean, who wouldn't want to study why the ancients did this when they see a photo like that? So. Sorry, girl, I interrupted you. No, that's really striking. No, I, I really like that picture. <laughs> Absolutely, that must be the solstice. Stonehenge. So, so how about the placement? Stonehenge. Why did they decide to put, for instance, Stonehenge there? And, I, you know, as I say, this is my local one, and it's very open now. There are very few trees around, but you kind of get mm. to feel that it might be the highest point in the landscape. Stonehenge is something quite significantly different to nearly every other stone circle and its placement in the landscape. With Stonehenge, we're still working on that, and so I'll tell you something quickly about it, then perhaps go back to the other great yeah. circles that were built between 300 and 500 years earlier than Stonehenge, So, oh, as, as we understand it at this okay. time. The Stonehenge Lanka is very, very uh, flat, but I, it... Um, Stonehenge connects very much with the placement of where other monuments are in the landscape. Right. And also there are issues with, there's a little bump, there's, there's only one really significant bump in the horizon for right. Stonehenge. And so that landscape, um, because it's so flat, they, I believe they had to build these very significant um, structures, which in a sense, as far as I'm, uh, our theory goes, that they replace mountainous locations or they are a replacement for, for other monuments that have hills surrounding them okay. so that they can then line up the sun or the moon in relation to that monument. Right. Um, shall, shall I just go back and yes. tell you what was happening yes. with tell the us landscape? About the, tell us about the placement of the, of the <laughs> other stone circles that you studied. Yes. Certainly. So the great circles, for example, um, uh, Kalanish on Lewis and Stennis on Orkney. And also we've looked at now um, two sites in Cumbria. Uh, one's called uh, Swinside and the other is Castle Rig, a very famous one. 
Mm. And these sites have quite an amazing landscape surrounding them. And basically, there are two kinds of landscapes that I've found across Western Scotland for uh, scores of sites at this point. And the first basic idea is that the north horizon must be very close and relatively higher than the southern horizon, which is much further away and lower. And as well as being higher, it has significant peaks or slopes in the northeast and the northwest, so that, this, for example, the summer solstice sun will rise out of this significant peak in the close northern horizon and then nice. set in the significant close peak in the northwest. And then the moon which only um, at its most extreme rising and setting point in the north will rise and set out of that same set of hills. And so we have this kind of, that's just one kind of landscape. The other one is the inverse of that, where the southern horizon is the closest and the northern is further away. So, and you know, basically, to, oh, sorry, go on. If, if, you, <laughs> if you had spotted this on just one of these stone circles, you know, it might just be a bit of a coincidence, a bit of a fluke, but exactly. this link between the topography on all of the stone circles that you, you studied, it, it kind of suggests, doesn't it, that this was a very deliberate placement of these stone so circles in relationship to the surrounding topography? Um, in, and the short answer is uh, yes. Um, basically what we did though initially was look at um, the initial sites were there's only a few stone circles, but many standing stone monuments like stone rows or stone mm. pairs. And they were all built around about 1400 to uh, 900 BC. So when we then started looking at the great circles, we then discovered exactly the same kinds of landscape choices and orientation choices on the very first groups of circles that were ever built 2000 years earlier. So we actually have a pattern that seems to go on for over 2,000 years in relation to the landscape and the kind of astronomical phenomena that was considered important in their understanding of the universe. Wow. I, I mean, you have to really visit these stone circles to really feel them. And, and, I, and I have to say, you get quite an emotion. I get a, quite an emotional response when I'm around any of these things. Um, you know, it's, it's not that I feel an energy or anything. It's just... You know, there is a, mm. an emotional response to these ancient stone circles. So now, Gail, we love to ask all of our guests how they first got inspired to uh, look up into space or first got inspired to study uh, science. I had a great science teacher. Other guests have read a, a single book or maybe a TV science fiction thing. What was it that gave you your first spark uh, to get involved in science? Mm. It was probably as far back as school. <laughs> so I had, an, uh, for example, I had excellent both mathematics and biology teachers, for example, and I really, really found both subjects fascinating. They presented it in such a way that made it stimulating and exciting and brought, and brought the world of, in a sense, the world of the miniature for me initially, so cellular biology, yeah. for example, and I found it fascinating that cells was actually responded and behaved similarly to an entire human body and that and that just pulled me straight in and then um, so, I loved all forms of a, analytical understandings of the universe. <laughs> isn't it amazing these little things you know that happen early on in life kind of set our path for the rest of our lives hopefully. Uh, Dr Hayden Bottom thank you so much for joining us today and staying up so late. Uh, we'd love to see you mm -hmm. back here to share more of the, this marvellous story of how the ancients mark the passage of time with these wonderful and intriguing great stone circles. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. I look forward to another visit. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. That was uh, Dr. Gail Higginbottom, uh, who stayed up very late for us uh, to, uh, to join us to, to tell us about her research into these great stone circles. Now we are looking at this fabulous live view of the Canary Islands. And just above where it says observatories there is where the uh, SLU Observatory is at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. You can see there, we are on top of a volcano, basically 8,000 feet above the Atlantic Ocean. In the background to the right, you can see the neighboring volcano, island of Gran Canaria. And uh, SLU members get to control those telescopes every single night. And also, 
get to watch the uh, the new solar telescope um, that we've been watching today as well. Now, uh, thank you so much for joining us to uh, celebrate September equinox. I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I have. We've seen these wonderful views of the sun from both the SLU Solar Telescope in the Canary Islands uh, and the great Earth view cams there around the globe. I love that one in Budapest and this one actually, yeah, the rising sun. Look at that glistening off the water, I think, and buildings there. Great, great views. Uh, but it was our guests that made the show for me today. You know, we had Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, uh, who told us about some of those celebrations associated with Equinox. That goose breastbone, if you remember. If, if I saw a blue breastbone on a goose, I'm not sure I'd eat it. But anyway, uh, and of course, we, uh, we failed miserably to, uh, well, I'm sorry, Gail kind of failed, but I did. Uh, we did manage to live on air balance this. And I'll tell you how we balanced it. There was no trickery involved. It actually has nothing to do with Equinox, I'm afraid to say. How cool would that be if it were? But actually, if you feel, I, I have two eggs with me today. Uh, the first one is very smooth and I couldn't balance that at all. This one has some tiny little kind of gritty bits on it. And it's those, you get three of those and you line that, those up and that's sufficient to support the egg. If you want to do it scientifically, you don't just do it on the equinox because you don't do it on equinox and say, I succeeded, therefore it must be true. You have to do it the rest of the year as well if you want to follow the scientific method. Anyway, I'm going to be eating this one a little bit later. Uh, fried. Uh, who else did we have on the show? We had Slew Astronomer and Astronomy Editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Uh, he joined us to talk about the mechanics uh, and some of the fascinating aspects of the equinox. And of course, our last guest there was uh, Dr. Gail Heapenbottom, a visiting research fellow at the University of Adelaide in Australia. She told us about her fascinating research into the ancient stone circles and how they've been used for millennia uh, to measure the precise position the sun and moon. What a great show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We hope to see you back here for another live exploration of space. And uh, if you can't wait until then, uh, make sure you join the SLU community because we do this every night as we share the night sky using SLU's mighty telescopes. Uh, I'm Paul Cox. This has been another astronomical production from SLU.com. We will see you very soon as we watch Sunrise in Seattle. Bye for now.